Hey, hey, hey! Oh my gosh, I am on such a time crunch. This is Edward. Welcome to More Geek Than Gay. We're just getting straight into this. There's no need to fear. Underdog is here. Howdy, howdy, hey! This is Edward. I am doing a quick, quick, quick episode of More Geek Than Gay because I am back to doing 10 hour shifts at work and I have very little time right now. That's really how this comes down. I meant to do all my recording last night, but I was a tired, tired, tired man. So I didn't. That's how it goes. Why was I tired? I'll get to that quickly in just a moment. But first, you'll notice, no Joseph, you get all me. Why? Because Joseph is still in California with Jeannie. They're doing the book tour. It is going very well from what I hear. They're just zooming along with her brand new book, showing everybody. So that's how come you get me, 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 me. So what have I been doing lately? Well, that's the reason why I've been tired. I'll, we'll just get right into the heart of this. This weekend was Leprechaun. Leprechaun 40, as a matter of fact. Now, Leprechaun and is one of the older sci-fi conventions here in the Valley area. It is a sci-fi fantasy convention. Its main focus has always been art. Okay, um, historically, there have been two kind of sister conventions. It's been Leprechaun and Coppercon. No one knows why this is called Leprechaun. Well, I'm sure historically, maybe there's a reason, and maybe the times have changed. But, yes, this is not March. Don't know why they still call it Leprechaun. It makes no sense. But, Leprechaun was the art convention and kind of Relaxicon. And Coppercon was more the big sci-fi fantasy convention. And they each had their place and people rotated back and forth and everything. They used to be downtown, they used to be big, these things go in cycles. So it's now, right, right now they're both little smaller conventions. They're definitely not Phoenix Comic Con. But they are, like, getting a nice momentum. And I'm hoping that we are looking at the upswing for these conventions. So this weekend, I was a moderator and participant of Leprechaun. Ta-da! An interesting thing about being part of Leprechaun this year, it almost was like a small high school reunion for me. Yeah. I went to Alhambra High School here in Arizona, which, if if you're familiar with anything, there's also an Alhambra that is like a major competing theatrical school or whatever in California. This is Alhambra here in Arizona. Alhambra actually used to be a major competing theatrical school, but just not, not one that sent shivers down anyone's spine in other states, although we did very well. I don't know if it's still that way or not. I haven't kept up on that. But my my friend in high school, uh, Tony Pettigamus, he was two years my senior, he is actually the person who was in charge of programming for Leprechaun. 
as such, he also brought in his friend, Pat Hole, who, by the way, was my friend in high school, two years my senior. And then we also ran in, uh, got to see Sean Dunham, who I believe was also two years my senior. Although he thought I was his senior, and I'm like going, hmm, maybe a closer examination in the mirror is in order for you. But that's a whole other story. And sweet guy, sweet, sweet guy. All of these guys, sweet guys. Matter of fact, Pat is so sweet that I called him the wrong name. I accidentally called him Wes. And he still went, Ed! And like all buddy pal sweet and everything. And I'm like, oh my god. And then the next day, I'm driving to Leprechaun and I'm thinking, wait a minute, his name isn't Wes, it's Pat. Oh no! So, I also got to meet Tony's wife, uh, who apparently has had heard stories about me. <laughs> and I wish I could deny them, but they're most likely all true. Then they um, got got to catch up on everything because my um, Tony is actually well versed in a lot of the people that we went to school with and everything. As a matter of fact, Mike Mercer, who I think was three years my senior or something like that. He is now Tony's brother-in-law, and the, the whole crowd, I, I'm like going, oh yeah, what happened to so-and-so? Oh, he's doing this. Oh, what happened to so-and-so? Oh, he's doing this. I have hit the age, and anyone who's like in their 40s probably has become aware of this, where if you keep asking, hey, what happened to so-and-so, you are eventually going to run into, oh, he died. And I did. There was like two of them at least. It's like, oh, okay. Um, well, that's awkward and makes me feel old. So, <laughs> on a selfish part, darn it. I'm at that age where people die. Man. Oh, yeah, and it's really sad that he died too. Um, <laughs> what you gonna do? So... That was actually very interesting, and like I said, it was very nice to meet Tony's wife, and I am I actually found out that they live much closer to me than what I always thought they did. For some reason, I thought they lived all the way, like, like 20 miles away and everything, which, while not a horrible schlep, when your car is not running well, it's a schlep, I'll tell you that. But no, he's just like a hoot away, not that far from actually where we all went to school. And so is Pat and all that. I'm going, all right, I can have friends again. <laughs> so, the con itself, really nice. Day one, I was a busy, busy, busy beaver because I had five panels to be on. Showed up. I was ready to get my badge and registration thing, but they actually had a line for registration. And... Fortunately, this nice guy, Paul, who's um, one of the people with the con, he just went, go straight to your panel, you can take care of registration later, don't worry about it. And so that was the obligatory Doctor Who panel, and we discussed obligatory Doctor Who stuff, had a nice lady in the audience who, I, she actually was one of the few people I've ever run into, or actually the only person I've ever run into, who remembered Doctor Who when it first came on the air. And, you know, she's all, this is revealing my age, but I'm like, going, you know what, reveal your age, we want to know this stuff. So that was really nice there. I got out of that, went straight to getting my registration stuff. I heard Tony coming by going, ah, oh, there's a great panel over there that only has two people in the audience, that sucks. And so, I finally get my packet. It takes about half an hour. If you run into anyone who went to Leprechaun 40, don't ask them about registration. Especially not participants. Tony was not part of this whole process. There's a whole bunch of people who were not part of this process who, unfortunately, as faces to Leprechaun, get to be kind of lumped in with this horrible, horrible registration process that went on. Especially given the fact that participants and staff, well, we weren't registering. We were already a list and should have just had stuff ready. But we had to wait in the same slow line as people who were just coming in off the streets. 
and get all our stuff ready because somehow they lost stuff and, and it, ugh, it was a nightmare. Ask anybody involved. Well, don't ask them. Don't ask them. We, no one wants to relive that horrible memory. So, half an hour later, I, finish, I finally get my packet and I go, oh, I'm going to go to that panel that Tony said. He said it's an interesting panel and everything. And it was about the, um, basically, where technology and humanity are starting to merge into one. And, wow, that is fascinating. So I started looking at my packet, and, holy crap, I have a panel right now. So, as the third person in that room, I had to, soon after sitting down, excuse myself rather awkwardly and go to my panel that I rather awkwardly showed up to half an hour late, which had Marcy. Hi, Marcy. And that one was the artist and the writer should be friends, or it might have been the writer and the artist should be friends. I don't know. That one was really nice. I'm really sorry I missed the beginning of it. Um, I got to kind of contribute my knowledge of how convoluted sometimes contracts can be regarding creator rights uh, and with artists and kind of give a quick rundown of the Siegel Schuster whole fiasco with Superman and DC Comics slash National Comics which is still going on to this day but then I had an hour break Ta da an hour break and it was then off to, or it might have been a two hour break I don't know there was a little bit of a break and then it was off to the podcast podcast panel where we were podcasting live except that the hotel didn't have the room ready and there weren't easy directions on how to get there so it, it so if you followed the directions that the hotel told people oh just go this way you couldn't get there that way they forgot to unlock doors and if you had shown up if you'd shown up before we got there at which I mean we got there on time but still if you'd shown up before we got there you would have shown up to an empty room and went, oh, this must be the wrong place. If, by some weird chance you had, imagined to get the, uh, managed to get there. So, that ended up being a little bit of a fiasco. We ended up starting out half an hour late, and but it was a very pleasant podcast. I'm going to put the link up to it if I can if I can find I knew what the link was live. I'm assuming that that live link what is the same link for listening to it after the fact. So I'll put that up for those of you who want to listen to that. See a little bit of the ins and outs of what goes on behind the scenes podcasting. And it was actually very entertaining. Two very lively um, panelists on with me who are much more experienced in their podcasting. So that was really nice to get some of their input and just meet them. I'll... Um, Unfortunately, I'm really bad with names, and so I don't remember who they were. <laughs> but I'll try to find that information and either have that ready for the next podcast or have that in this podcast's links. I had to leave halfway through this podcast because, as we said, we started half an hour late and it was supposed to be an hour-long podcast. I had to leave halfway through because I had my GLBT panel which unfortunately sometimes got derailed into instead of being GLBT in fandom and genre it kind of became derailed at moments of just being GLBT and that's a great discussion to have it's just that that wasn't the topic and it was sometimes hard to rein it back into the topic um, it was also the first time though that they ever had that topic at Leprechaun and I'm really hoping that it does get to come back again. On that panel had Yvette from Samurai Comics. She was really good. Tina came in as support and everything. She was our token straight person. And we also had Sky, who is um, also Joseph's co-worker. He's a New York Times bestselling author. Uh, does a lot of like shaman stuff, Native American stuff. He was there. It was a very pleasant um, panel. A lot of nice interaction with the crowd. But from there, couldn't even linger much on that because from there, Tina and I had to go do the TV roundup panel, 
which neither one of us knew what we were going to talk about for that. Yeah. And that ended up being a nice little discussion, but at the same time, it was the end of a long day for me. I don't know about Tina, but my brain had already started to melt. So, I can't even tell you how that panel went, because I was barely aware of that panel happening. After that happened, it was time for going home. Go home, Edward. Hung out with Tina, actually, for a little while, and... Um, her publisher of some of her books, I, I believe it was her publisher. So that was really nice. That also happened to be the lady who was on the podcast podcast panel. Finally went home, got up the next day, realized, crap, my panel starts like way too early, had to get gas on the way. There's like no gas stations between here and there. And that's a flipping like 20 mile drive where I was having difficulty finding a gas station. What happened to the good old days when when you're driving on the freeway and you get off, there's always going to be a gas station at pretty much any exit off the freeway? What happened to those good days? Hmm? Anyway, matter of fact, I got off because I saw a Circle K sign, and I'm like going, thank God, there's a convenience store there. I happen to hit the only Circle K I've run into in years that doesn't have a gas station. Yeah. I don't So, I arrived late for that panel. Fortunately, so did pretty much everyone else of the panel. That was a really nice panel about publishing independent comics. I was just going to be a moderator, basically, for that panel. The guys that were on it, they didn't really need a moderator. I know next to nothing about publishing independent comics. I know a little bit about what goes into making comics. Like, when they talked about lettering, I'm like, well, yeah, a lot of them use computer programs. There's even artists and letterers that will have a font made on their keyboard that is their handwritten font. So I was able to contribute that and that a lot of times that's not as expensive as what it sounds like it would be. But they handled that perfectly fine. They were great on that panel. After that, I had, what was right after that one? Because it was immediately after that I had my next panel where I, and I was on that panel and for the life of me, I cannot remember what that panel was. I And the interesting thing about this is that I kind of ended up being on panels that I wasn't on or contributing to panels that I wasn't on just because I, in between, had an 11-hour space of nothing to do before my next panel. And my next panel was the Writing Smut panel. Uh, I ended up contributing to the Strange Love panel that happened two hours prior to that, where, which talked about writing romance and the how you handle romance in sci-fi and horror that sometimes isn't even between correct, or not correct, but entirely human species or the same species. You know, is on Doctor Who, is the lizard woman and the earth woman, are they having a lesbian relationship? Is it still a lesbian relationship, even though they're both female, when they're when neither one of them are the same species? And could Kirk and Ahorta have a relationship? Where is that fanfic? Where and, and it dawned on me later that it wouldn't be Kirk and the Horta. It would actually be Spock and the Horta. So we did, we, and I got to give Jeannie and Jordan's speech about the difference between erotica, romance, and smut. And I, I even used your V, Jeannie. Yep. And Jordan, I used your whole little def definition with the whole discovery and everything. You guys would both be so proud of me. Okay. It is amazing how much I have listened to you two and picked up stuff here and there. Matter of fact, I even had to kind of... Well, redirect one of the panelists who kept on blaming Amazon for labeling his stuff as erotica. And he's like going, I wrote these sex scenes, but it's a love story. That, and I'm like, well, you wrote these sex scenes. You are no longer just simple romance. I don't care if you think it was romance in your mind. You're at least erotic romance. <laughs> okay, so there's a reason why... Amazon didn't just blithely, blithely? 
just blindly decide to label your stuff that way. No, 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 there was content in there that enabled them to go, okay, that's what this is, because that's what it was due to content. That's kind of like, you know, going, I wrote this really nice story about a kitten and a doggy trying to find their way home, and they just happened to follow a serial killer on his, on his rampage, and for some reason the ratings board decided to rate it an R, when actually I wrote a children's story about a kitten and a puppy going home. Well, no, you included a whole bunch of grizzly murders in the middle. It's, it's an R-rated movie. You included people having sex and described the sex. It's no longer just a simple little fluffy romance. Not to imply that romances necessarily are fluffy, but you know what I mean. It's not a simple, like, ah, oh, pleasant, I can read this with grandma romance. It is entering the realm of erotica, hence the labeling. And I got that from you girls. Yes, I did. Or ladies. So, and that carried over into the writing smut panel, which... I really didn't, I truly thought that smut was going to be somewhat of a euphemism for, we're talking about erotica. The panelists took it as writing smut, um, which made a very interesting panel to be moderator on. But then, it was time to go home, except for I ended up hanging out with Tony and Pat, just hanging out, catching up on old times, so I didn't get home until like 3 in the morning to turn back around and go back to the con the next day where I had my panels on um, well actually I just had the one panel on horror versus humor which very nice panel unfortunately a lot of the people on the panel really I don't think I think they genuinely didn't think there was a way for horror and humor they agreed that horror and humor share a lot of the same properties juxtapositioning of expectations, uh, timing is essential. But at the same time, I don't think that they thought that horrific things could have humor in them so much. Uh, they did find comedies that had horror in them. It could be a comedy and you could introduce some horror in it, but it's still just a comedy. And you could have horror and bring in a little bit of comedy to lighten the mood, but the two really couldn't be bedfellows. Which, well, I that's a very valid art um, statement, and it would have been nice to discuss that. It was hard to discuss it because they just pretty much no, I don't see that working. Well, why? Well. And then it just became a matter of then discussing things that they saw that were, you could put a horrible thing in a comedy, or you could put a com and it's like, no, 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 go back to why, what, what is it inherently that makes these two things not work, and what could you do to possibly make it work? So, or what is it that people should avoid to avoid the things that make those two things not work? It was really hard kind of getting there, but still a very nice, insightful panel. And we followed up with, what did we follow up with? As I said, it was a whirlwind, whirlwind of a, um, of a weekend with just so many things going on all at once. And... I ended up being, like I said, on panels or moderating panels that I wasn't originally involved with. Like the Strange Love one, I was brought in as moderator for that. Just because the, the lady who was moderator, well, she was actually a panelist. She had stuff to contribute that way. And I'm not saying that a panelist can't be a contributor. But it is really nice if you're one of the panelists to have someone else take the direction so that you can impart your information and your knowledge without having to think of where are we going next with this. Um, with this one, if any of you have seen me at Comic-Con, you know that in general I just kind of toss out usually a couple softballs and then I go to the audience and try to keep the audience interaction going. These were more s discussion panels. Uh, used m I used much more of a like a James Lipton type approach where I was an active participant 
in the moderation, even though I really was directing it towards them, here's your things, and then, well, what do you think, and stuff like that. So, there was a definite difference in my approach, but it was, it was a very fun weekend. I, I, the errors of the registration process, I have been assured, is not going to happen again, and I believe the person who told me that, because that person was one of the competent people all weekend that was helping everybody out, and every he was fantastic over the whole weekend. So I look forward to seeing what he does with the next Leprechaun. I, I would like to be involved with the next one because he did a great job in his part and picking up pieces here and there and helping all of the guests and all the participants feel good when when we were fortunate enough to have, well, when we unfortunately had a problem, but we're fortunate enough to have him solve it. Um, Tony did a lot of that too, but Tony was more behind the scenes, so he wasn't a visible face. He had to run around and do stuff. But Paul, please let his name be Paul, I'm horrible with names. Paul was a fantastic face of the con who also solved problems. And he's going to be even a bigger part of it next year, and I look forward to seeing that. That's going to be basically all I talk about this time. I know this is a very short, brief thing. Like I said, I have these 10-hour shifts. i got to get to go into work. Huh. Don't forget to catch me again, because Joseph's still going to be out of town, so catch me, hi, me, again on Thursday, where... I will hopefully do more, have, give you more information. I will pick up the pieces here with some of the stuff that I unfortunately was not able to get to during this episode. I do want to catch a couple things. I forgot that when Kim joined us, Danny actually happened to catch that episode. Danny is the person that we talked about stealing his car. And he was going, oh, that's how you guys stole my car? It's like, yep. That's how we stole your car, dude. So, now you know. And knowing is half the battle. Don't let people just have your car keys when chaos is already erupting around you. And not expect them to just possibly change sides, because that's funny. <laughs> Thank you all for being with us, or with me, this week. I look forward to hearing any comments you have. And now I'm going to roll into the closing music. Yeah! I'm a guy you might recognize, you've seen me on TV. I've done 30 or 40 movies, hey, you only remember three! Worked a lot in Hollywood, shot a lot of celluloid, but behind the glitz and glamour, I am mostly unemployed. People recognize me almost everywhere I go. They follow me into the men's room and they like to say hello. They think I'm rich and famous, but that's kind of a joke. Cause I'm only sort of famous and I'm often close to broke. So what do you do when the bills are due and you don't have a job? Owing money ain't that funny when you're not on top. You gotta bend before the break and tough financial tension. I'll be a low level celebrity at a sci-fi convention, yeah. I go to this phantasmagoria sci-fi con, 17, right, in New Jersey somewhere. Uh, they, right, I'm in a hotel ballroom with the folding hotel tables next to all these actors trying to sell their picture for money, you know. So I'm next to a, an older gentleman. Not, you know, not that old, but, no, but old, he's, you know, he's been around a long time. I don't recognize him from anything. So I'm trying to be, oh, it's great. Well, you're an actor too. And what were you in? He's, uh, Planet of the Apes. Oh, Planet of the... You mean The Rise of the Planet of the Apes with James Franco? No, no, I was... No. Oh, uh, wow, Planet of the Apes, the movie with Charlton Heston. Just, no, no, I was in Planet of the Apes, the TV series. Oh. Yeah, I didn't know they made one either. <laughs> 
Sat at the convention, acting cool and nonchalant. Eddie Munster's having breakfast in the hotel restaurant. Over there's Wonder Woman, over here's some guy from MASH. Use your fame, sign your name, as long as they got cash. Cling on shooting phasers while Ewoks go to town. There are 50 Harry Potters, if he weighed 500 pounds. Some Dombey walks on past me with makeup on his face. It's a Twilight Zone ET phone home, cause I am lost in space. Well, Jedi Knights, lightsaber fights, Chewbacca's running around. Star Trek freaks and sweaty geeks, my brains are breaking down. Well, this isn't really working out. I need an intervention, cause I'm a low-level celebrity at a sci-fi convention. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm meeting these people, right? They're all in line to come up and meet me and everything. I swear to you, two guys are next to each other. The plastic pencil holder guys, you know. So they're into this, man. They're into this. They're having an argument as they come to the front of my line to meet me. The guy I, says, like, well, first of all, Todd, what you're forgetting, Ewoks live in the bottom of the forest. Wookiees are in the tops of trees. Oh, one other thing, different planets. And he looks at me and says, were you in police academy? No. They said it's easy money. They said you gotta go. Check out all the other actors making lots and lots of dough. But selling out the past, I lost my marbles bit by bit. So I waved goodbye to Lou Ferrigno. I packed my bag and split. <laughs> Where you going, butthead? Hey, the party's just begun. Uh, no, I think I'm gonna split, man. My experiment is done. They stared at me with open mouths. The fanboy's all in shock. So to break it to him gently, I waved goodbye like Spock. Hey, no big deal, but it didn't feel like it was my thing. They did collect an autographs, but I got a song to sing. But if times turn back to tough again, things start getting darker, I'll just whip out a stack of eight by tens and break out my magic marker. That's right. Step right up. Meet international superstar Tom Wilson. Wilson. No, not Owen. No, not Luke. Wilson. No, not Flip. Maybe you recognize him from Police Academy or Planet of the Apes, the TV series. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. I gotta go. I gotta go. Okay, that was Tom Wilson, comedian, with the sci-fi convention song. Yay. Really quick, I remember what my panel was. <laughs> Superhero costumes. Um, I had been thinking it was going to be basically their costumes in comic books. But we also had a very nice cosplayer who does a lot of cosplay work and makes costumes for people. So we were able to talk about it in, also in reality, that there is a difference between what makes a practical costume in reality versus what works in comic books. Because in comic books, well, they have exotic materials. So suddenly, yeah, that costume does make perfect sense in a comic book. But we can't do that here in reality. So, pst, that would, um, we all came to agreement that, yeah, there are women out there who would wear the boob window of Power Girl. And that's part of the reason why that costume is so popular at conventions amongst cos cosplayers. Because if a woman has a nice rack, she might want to just put that out there. Also, we all came to agreement that, really, Wonder Woman's costume, however skimpy it may be, um, we, would, we all agreed that there were certain tweaks that we would like to see. Not much more covering, though. Uh, we, also, we pretty much all agreed that she's one who probably wouldn't even care if she was naked. And if people were ogling her, well, that's on them. What a shame that they cannot really appreciate people, instead they have to ogle bodies. You know, she would actually just feel sorry for those who are ogling her. So, in that the whole protection thing, 
there have been warriors in the past that wore just as little protection as what as little coverage as what she would wear so but again we all did have little tweaks that we wanted to do uh we're i don't think any of us were really tickled with her current incarnation of the costume and all could see problems with the past ones so uh, did have problems with the over-sexualization, though, of many, many female costumes. And how many cosplayers will over-sexualize costumes even more so in dress when they don't seem to appreciate the character. They're actually just trying to be as sexy of that character as possible. But a lot of people out there doing great cosplay, and there are a lot of really good costumes. They all pretty much were in agreement, more pockets. And I kind of get more pockets, but I'm like going, we really want to return to the 90s costumes of more pockets. Because we saw more pockets in the 90s, and wow, those are some ugly, bulky things that had so many pockets, I don't even know how people moved in them. Matter of fact, that was one of the comments in Legion of Superheroes, is how they couldn't even really, there were so many pockets, they couldn't even do anything. So the pockets led to confusion. But we also talked about the sexy costumes from the Legion of Superheroes, where even the men were included, and that's how, even how cheesy, sexy those were. It was the future, different mores, and there were a couple men who had, you know, the, the Cosmic Boy bustier. Still love the Cosmic Boy bustier. Ha! Huh. So, that was a really fun panel. We actually even ended up with um, the chair for Leprechaun, at that panel, so that was great. Want to thank you all for sticking around with me, us, ta-da. Don't forget about Compete Magazine. They've been helping us out with advertising here and there. I will include a link to them. Joseph has an article in with them again this month, so you want to check that out. Also, Joshua Tree Feeding Program. They help people with HIV and AIDS get food. They have a sister program that helps people feed their pets so they don't have to choose between feeding their pets and feeding themselves. The link will be right here for that too. Don't. Also, I apologize, no comic book story time this week, or this episode. I have things all planned, it's just a case of timing, timing, timing. I apologize because that actually, we even talked about that during the um, con that possibly Comic Story Time may be spinning off into its own podcast. So, if that does, I'll keep you guys abreast of that. Mickey, I'm really glad that you enjoyed it. Hi, Mickey. And it will be coming back. Don't worry. I've got stories. Da -da -da, my stories. So, thank you, thank you, thank you. I look forward to seeing your comments. I look forward to catching you all later, and I hope you all have a good week, and I will be back on Thursday. Bye!